Turn with me to uh, two openings that we've been looking at already this, uh, this week. Let's go to the um, book of Proverbs and then also to the book of Luke. And you said you're believing with me, right? Yes. I got a lot of things in my spirit. And I'm just believing him to know what, where, and when. Right? And you're believing with me, right? You're believing with me. And there's a number of factors in play, but I'm just believing the Lord help us get it just right, just right. In uh, Proverbs, scriptures that we've looked at all uh, this week so far, the 28th chapter and the 20th verse, a, a principle, something that the Lord says happens, and when He says it happens this way, we believe it happens this way. Right. A faithful man, He said. What will happen with him? He or she will abound. With blessings. Yeah, that's right. hmm? Any faithful people in here? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Then knows uh, uh, what's a mark of a person who actually is a faithful person? Abounding. abounding. Abounding with blessings. If you're not abounding as much as you'd like to be, don't accuse the word of not being true. Right? right. Check up on how faithful yeah. have I been. And we've covered a lot of ground already. If you weren't with us, this is your first night. Let me encourage you to get the CDs or DVDs, download the messages from online and uh, get caught up with us. We've seen from the Word that faithfulness is not a common quality. You don't find faithful people everywhere. It's actually relatively rare. And that a whole lot of people will tell you they're faithful. I'm quoting Scripture now. But that doesn't mean they are. A faithful man is uh, challenging to find, or woman. And he said, though, the, the man who, or woman who is faithful, tell me again what happens to them? They abound. I just like saying that. Abound. <laughs> Don't you like saying that? Sounds like a God word to me. Abound. <laughs> not, not just with stuff but with blessings. Yeah. Having a lot of stuff is not the same as being blessed. There's people that's got a lot of money and stuff and they're miserable. They're not blessed. You can't even enjoy a new car like you should unless you're blessed, unless you're right with God. Can't even enjoy a new house like you're supposed to unless you're right with Him, unless there's a blessing involved. But what the Scriptures say, when the Lord adds it to you, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, truly rich. And there's no sorrow with it. There's nothing negative. There's no downside to it when he adds it to you. It's a blessing. Now in Luke, the 16th chapter, look there again, Luke 16 and 10. Luke 16 and 10 says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that's unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Keep going. If therefore you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who shall commit to your trust the true riches? Verse 12. And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? We, we see God's way of increasing and promoting. He does it based on faithfulness. Now, it's easy to think, well, I know that, but do you? A lot of people think they should be promoted based on their abilities or based on their tenure. Come on, are you listening? Or based on their extreme efforts. God doesn't promote based on any of those things. It's quiet in here. (laughs) God doesn't promote you because you're better at it than their other people. He doesn't promote you and increase you because you've been doing it longer than other folks. 
Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> now, am I making this up or is this a scripture? How does God, on what basis does God promote? God promotes according to faithfulness. God increases, gives you more based on you being faithful with what the first part he gave you, the little that he gave you. If you're faithful with the little. Now, there's a lot of ways you can get stuff other than God giving it to you. That's where some of the confusion comes in. Just because somebody's got a lot of stuff, that don't mean God gave it to them. We don't know how they got that. Right? But we're talking about God adding it to you. And when he adds it to you, when he promotes you, when he increases you, don't you remember Galatians says, don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season, what's going to happen? We'll reap. What if we don't faint? There's a right time and a right way for it to come. You can add stuff to yourself through extreme debt, lying, manipulating people. There's all kinds of ways that people get stuff. That don't mean the Lord added it to you. But when the Lord adds it to you, when the Lord brings you up and puts you in a place where you have more authority or more influence, he did it based on what? Faithfulness. With everybody, every time, he did it based on faithfulness. You remember, we're going to talk about this later, I, I think, but in the parable of the talents, when he said, you've been faithful over a few, now be ruler over much, he said the exact same thing to the man that got 10 as the man that got five, the exact, I mean verbatim. Yeah. Why? Because it wasn't based on how much they got. Yeah. It was based on faithful. And if this man was as faithful with his as this man was with his, then the, 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 the number, the size, the notoriety is not the basis of the promotion or increase. It's the faithfulness, which makes us all on level ground. Doesn't it? You know? In, in the things of God, we, we just had an offering. Did you know that nobody in here uh, was unable to outgive another because of lack of ability. Because God doesn't look at the amount. He looks at the heart and the percentage. That makes us all even. You can't outgive somebody else in God's eyes because you got more money or more stuff. Don't you remember Jesus one day? The Bible said he was watching the offering. Is that right? <laughs> Well, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't he? Oh, some folks didn't like that. <laughs> if he ever watched an offering, I reckon at least he could again. And he was watching how much they put in. What if I did that today? What if I did that tonight? Oh, man. Boy, that'd be talked about. I said, no, we're not going to pass the bucks now. Everybody come up down to the front. And then when you walk by, I said, here, let me see that. <laughs> okay. <all right>. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Boy, that'd be talked about. And yet, I'd be following Jesus' example. Because <laughs> on this occasion, didn't he? Bible said he watched. Well, how else would he know? Because when he said, the widow woman came, in, came along, put her two mites in there. And he said, this is something. Look at this. This woman has outgiven everybody here today. Now, don't you know the, the, the fat cats that put their big check in? They thought, say what? What? <laughs> no way. No way that little woman outgave me. He said, yes, she did. Yes, she did. She outgave everybody here today. It wasn't in amount, but it was in percentage and it was in heart. Come on, can you see this? You're not promoted because of your abilities. Go with me over to the book of uh, 
Luke. Well, are you still in Luke? Well, you're already here. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, <laughs> Y'all mighty quick to laugh at me tonight. I'm glad. Luke 9. I'm going to just go ahead and say some things. No need changing now, is it? I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, if you were here first night, I, I, there was, I got to a place and I said, I don't know if I'm going to say that. Let me think about that. Well, I thought about it. I'm going to go ahead and say it now. <laughs> I won't tell you when I'm saying it so you won't. <laughs> God doesn't promote according to ability or skill or talent or experience. What has happened is people have brought worldly, ungodly mentalities into the church. And they try to operate in church like the ungodly world does. People want to know what their job description is. <laughs> so as to make sure they don't have to do anything that's not in that job description. People want to know how much uh, money and are we sure you've got to be guaranteed that much. Preachers do meetings like that I hear. Folks say, you know how much you're going to guarantee me to come? You got to guarantee me at least this much to come be a part of your conference. I know a friend of mine said one time he, he was going to ask a guy about coming. The guy told him that. He said, Well, how many salvations are you going to guarantee me? <laughs> how many families in my church? How many healings and deliverances are you going to guarantee me? <laughs> See, that's the way entertainers do yeah. Yeah. That's right. out in the world. That's, right. that's the way speakers do. You have to, get, you have to pay for all their expenses. And, and there's nothing wrong with somebody taking care of his expenses. What I'm talking about is demanding it, mm -hmm. requiring it. To me, it's real simple. The Lord either directed you to go or he didn't. That's right. That's right. If he did, you look to him to take care of you. Right? right? <clears throat> you should see some of the looks I'm getting across the crowd. Eh? Well, I haven't digressed now. How does God promote? On what basis does he promote? Should we think like him? Should we function in his ways? Didn't the Bible say as, uh, as children we should imitate him? Right? Follow his example? I've had people say, well, you're just trying to act just like Jesus. I thought that was the idea. Right? You, you got a better example for me to follow? We should endeavor to do things the way our Father does. Well, then if you have any position of authority and it's time to promote somebody or use somebody for a larger capacity, upon what basis should that be? Of course, number one, the leading of the Spirit. And how is He going to lead you? On what basis? It's not going to be because they're more talented than anybody else. Because they have more ability than everybody else. Or because they have the most experience than everybody else. It's going to be because they've been faithful. They were faithful in an area. Uh, you see here in Luke 9, verse 57, exactly what we're talking about. Jesus said, Luke 9, 57, he said, it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. He heard this more than once. And you know the reason why? People saw the power of God. They saw the miracles. They saw, and they were moved, and rightly so. And so they were moved to come and say, man, I'm, I'm with you. Let's, uh, what do you need? I will help you. Man, I don't care. I'll shine your shoes. I'll tote your bag. What, what? I'm with you. And Jesus said, verse 58, 
He said, I don't have a place. <laughs> Why say that? Why say that? Because obviously this guy's looking for a place. Hmm? We see when he fed the multitudes, he, Jesus brought out the next day that a lot of the people were there, not because of the word or because of God, but because they got a free meal. And they were looking for some more free meals. They thought, well, I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> we just find somebody with a lunch and get it to Jesus and we got it made from now. <laughs> and verse 59, keep going. Another one came. Well, he, excuse me, he said to one, follow me. Is everybody awake now? But he said what? He said, Lord, I'd be glad to under one condition. Faith doesn't make conditions. Faithfulness doesn't make conditions and stipulations. That doesn't work with God. And yet people are trying to do it right and left because they got a world mentality. Their mind has not been renewed. You can't come to God and deal with the things of God with a union mentality. <laughs> you can't have a labor versus management mentality and think you got to negotiate. Now in the world, I understand. There's some, some owners and some management that have treated people poorly and badly. I understand that. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the kingdom. When you get to church, you need to leave your union head outside. Come on, are y'all with me or not? Because that's not, the, you, you're not going to negotiate with him. You say, well, God, I will, uh, I'd be glad to get there and there help, but now you, we need to get some things straight here. <laughs> what's my job description? <laughs> and what's my pay going to be? What kind of benefits are we talking about here? You know what the Lord will say to you? Unqualified. You are not qualified. Is that, is that my idea? Or, let's read. The man said, you know, Lord, I'm ready to go. Except, how many know there can't be any accepts? There can't be any ifs, if I get, if you'll let me, if I can. Hmm? That, that's, all of those are revealing unfaithfulness. That the faith is not there and the commitment is not there. Verse 60, Jesus said, let the dead bear their dead. In other words, is he saying, okay, you can do that, no problem? No. He's saying, I said, follow me. So what about what I asked you? Well, the answer is obvious. You, no answer. You're either going to follow me or you're not. Yeah, but, no but. You're going to do it or you're not. You come on and let's preach, let's preach the kingdom. Verse 61. Another said, Lord... I will follow you, but, everybody say conditions. conditions. Can you see this? Conditions. Conditions. I will, if, if I can work it uh, with what I want to do, if I can work it in with the other things that I got going, if you can guarantee me X amount, if you can based on that. See, that's an ungodly, worldly mentality. And Jesus won't accept it. I mean, scriptures, a lot of times, the folks haven't wanted to read very much, but didn't he say, if you're not willing to, to leave uh, anybody, everybody, your own life, you can't be my disciple. That's right. Is that what he said? Yes. You got to be willing 
to go anywhere, do anything. You can't have any stipulations. You can't have any conditions because if you do, that means that's a part of your heart you're not trusting to him. A part of your life you've got to keep for yourself. He's not totally your Lord. He said, I will follow you, but under this condition, this stipulation that you'll let me go and bid farewell those which are at home at my house. And see, here's the thing. He's thinking, sure, he'll let me do that. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't he? Verse 62. And Jesus said, no man that's put his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus said, if you don't get this straight, you're not, you're not qualified. Yeah. Yeah. You're not fit to do this. I don't know if this has been preached as strong maybe as it should be. It you know, so many times people are thinking, actually, uh, ministers have been misrepresenting the Lord. I know uh, years ago, there was a brother who came and said, kind of same kind of thing like this. He said, man, Brother Keith, God has dealt with me. I'm supposed to help you. And I said, praise God. And so he began to, and some things happened. And, and then one of, one of the first major times we needed him, he said, I'm sorry, I can't. I got this going on. I'd like to, but I just, you know, I got things come up, and I just, I just can't. And so I said, well, I said, that, that's all right. That's okay, you know. And as he's walking away, the Lord spoke to me and said, I didn't say it was okay. <laughs> I thought, sorry, Lord, I, I, just, I just misrepresented you. Because I told him it was okay. And the Lord said, I didn't say it was okay. How many think the kingdom of God is supposed to be absolutely first? Everything else is a way back seat, number two, below it. And when it's time to do his things, everything else needs to be put on pause, put on the shelf, right? And let's seek first the kingdom of God. Do what he's supposed to do. Now, what we're talking about is still faithfulness. Faithfulness. Doing it his way. Doing what he told us to do. No conditions, no stipulations. <laughs> Hear how quiet it is? Can we keep going? Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> uh, go with me, you're, you're there in uh, close by here. Luke 6, let's look at this and then let's move on into some. Rich things. How many believe the Word of God is rich, rich, rich? It is so rich. Are there things in here we haven't seen yet? Are they good things that would just thrill us from top to bottom and lift us up out of murk and mire and confusion and set us free, free, totally free? Luke 6, verse 46. Jesus said something, and I want us to ponder it uh, for the rest of the evening here. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? <laughs> That's a contradiction. Why do you call me Lord? See, the enemy is so subtle. He, the way, uh, I, I've been believing, especially for the last couple of years, asking the Lord, Lord, show me what's you and what's not you. Because I just, I just sensed in my spirit, there is so much junk in the church that people are calling God that's got nothing to do with God. And I, I don't want to think that and believe that. I want to know the truth. Don't you? I, even if it's something I've thought all my life, I want to get it knocked out of them if it ain't right. Don't you? And, I'm, and, I, and he's answering our prayer. He, he's doing it. He's showing us things. Thanks be unto God. And uh, one of these is how subtle the enemy is with religion. 
to, to skew things. We know we got into last night what people think faithfulness is and how that it's actually quite different, real faithfulness, than what a lot of people call faithfulness. And this with Jesus being Lord. How many people you reckon across the planet call Jesus Lord? And yet, the truth is, they've only accepted him as Savior. They have not given him lordship in their life. Because when you give him lordship, what does that mean? You do what he says. Every day. Every night. If you miss it, you get it right. You, you repent and you get back on it. But you don't just say, you know, I do my life the way I want to live. But thank God I got Jesus on retainer as Savior. And a lot, well, I won't go into all that. <laughs> it's enough for right now. But Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? Why? That's a contradiction. If he really is your Lord, come on, help me out. If he really is your Lord, how, how do we know? You do what he says. You do what he says when nobody's around. You do what he says when it's the exact opposite of what you thought you wanted to do. You do what he says when everybody else is doing something else. You do what he says. You do what he says. You do what he says. How many would lift a hand and say, Jesus is my Lord? Is that your desire? Is that your heart? Come on, say it out loud. Then Jesus, you are my Lord. Not just in talk, but in truth. And I know that means, know that, means that, whatever that whatever you say, that's what I do. What I do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, Lord Jesus, my, my Lord. Lord. Glory to God. Go with me to the book of John, the second chapter. John chapter 2, he's helping us. John 2, is the wedding feast and the occasion of the first miracle in Jesus' ministry. The Bible said it was the beginning of miracles in his ministry. And you know the story that Jesus' mother told him they're out of wine. And he said, what's that to do with us? My time's not yet come. And, and verse 5, what did she do? By the Spirit of God, she gave the key to miracles. Right here. What is it? Jesus said, excuse me, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Hmm? See, not, not even too big of a response because everybody thinks they already know that. Young's literal says, his mother said to the ministrants, whatever he may say to you, do. That's the literal rendering. Whatever he may say to you, do. Say it out loud. Whatever he says to you. Do. Whatever he says to you. Do it. You know the rest of the story? He turned at one point and said, go fill those water pots up with water. Now could they have gone 30 different ways with that? Could they have thought? One of the first questions that would have popped in your mind is, Why? We're not out of water. We're out of wine. <laughs> we got a party to attend to. I need to check on the cake. The chips are running low. <laughs> right? I need to run out and get some dip. Huh? Need some more balloons blowed up or what, whatever, whatever the cake. Well, it's, it's a wedding. Excuse me. Well, they have balloons at weddings. Um, 
There's all kind of stuff you need to do, and you can't just take, uh, you know, take a water hose and go and put it in these big pots and fill them up. No, we're talking about serious work. You got to go down to the well. You got to draw up the water. You got to haul it and pour it in in a bucket at a time. We're talking about getting hot and sweaty and dusty and taking some time. And while you're doing all this, who's taking care of the party? But what was the word of the Lord that came to him through his mother? What was the word? Whatever he says to you, do it. Now that is so simple. A three-year-old can get it. And yet millions of folks, you cannot persuade them to do it. Why? It is so simple. Just Do what he told you to do. And yet millions absolutely will not. They will harden their heart. They will stiffen their neck. They will say, you can't tell me what to do. Da, 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 and won't do it. Why? Why? It's so simple. And yet why is it such a big deal? There's substantial reason why it's a big deal. Can you help me get into it tonight? as to why it's such a big deal. In the very beginning, let's go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve had a test. Didn't they? It was the don't eat test. (laughs) Don't eat that test. How'd they come out? Hmm? We talked about this recently at the church. It's uh, 2 Corinthians talks about, what is it, chapter 11, where Paul said he was concerned about the saints at the church, uh, church at Corinth, lest their minds be corrupted and be removed from the simplicity that's in Christ, like Eve was, like what happened to Eve. What happened to Eve? Eve was crystal clear when the serpent said, has God said? She said, that's right, God said, you don't eat of that, you don't touch it, or you'll die. She's she's clear. It's simple. Don't eat it. Simple. And he, because she's listening to him, was able to corrupt that simplicity and say, yeah, but, and and no, but what about this? And look how pretty it is. And that's got to taste amazing. And actually, you won't die. Die. <laughs> and it began to be complicated. And it never was complicated. But it began to be complicated. And the end result is they failed the don't eat that test. Didn't they? What should they have done? Whatever he says to you. Do it. What did he say to them? Don't eat it. So what did they do? So they ate it. The one thing God tells them don't do. They get to the point where they think we're going to do this. Why? It's so simple. Because of the Spirit of disobedience. I'm quoting scripture. There is a spirit in this world. The God of this world is permeating the very airways and and the influences are all around about us and it is not just mental, it is not just physical, it is a spiritual push on your flesh and your unrenewed mind to say no, to rebel, to disobey. Put up on the screen for us, please, Ephesians. Ephesians, which is what I'm, I'm talking about, I'm quoting from. Ephesians and the second chapter and the first verse. Ephesians 2, 1 says, you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, verse 2, 
wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. What spirit is that? What, what course is that, the course of this world? The, the, what is the prince of the power of the air's influence? It is the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. He was bringing influence. When he was talking to Eve and them about how beautiful the fruit was and that they won't really die, we tend to look at it from an intellectual standpoint and think, well, don't believe him. But see, there's a whole lot more going on here. There is spiritual sway. When he's saying, look how beautiful it is, he's giving them feelings, sensations, pressure. Come on, are you listening? He's pushing them to do what he did. Disobey. Rebel. He is rebellion personified. You say up and he'll say down and cuss for no good reason. You say do it, he'll say no way and cuss for no reason. That's his nature. And all of us have experienced some of that nature because of our flesh. Have not Hmm? Hmm? Don't look at me so sanctified. You going to sit there and tell me that you, it's never risen up in you to go. No, you can't make me. I'm not going to do it. Hmm? When you learn about this, there'll be times you'll have to bite your lip. It'll, it'll push on you so hard. It'll, it'll, it'll rise on you so strong. If you don't get a hold of yourself, you'll express it and start acting on it. It's spiritual, mm-hmm. and it's very real. Amen. The feelings and the sensations and the pressure yeah. are real. That's why when you say, whatever the Lord says, do it. I know it sounds so simple. Then why do people find it so hard to do it? Because of what I'm talking about now. Yeah. The spirit yeah. uh, that works in the children of disobedience. That's it. Spiritual influences. And the thing you and I got to learn And get clear on how many think we ought to not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And we ought to be able to detect the push and pressure of the spirit of rebellion and disobedience from a mile down the road. And go, no, no. What I'm going to say no to is you. I'm not going to yield to you. And here's the thing. Sometimes you really want to rebel and say no. Good. Do it with the devil. Not with God, not with the people God's put over you. Do it with the devil. Get all up in his face and say, no, no, you can't make me. I'm never going to do it. Tell the devil that. Use his own stuff on him. But the reason why you keep seeing this over and over and over again and people failing the simplest tests I mean, there's so many things. The Lord asks you to do one simple thing. And it should be so simple. Just do it. But the very moment, what will happen? The enemy will come. And he'll begin to try to reason with you. and Show you reasons why you shouldn't do it. and Give you feelings that you don't want to do it. And and, and, have you ever noticed this before? For some reason, you just don't feel like doing it. (laughs) There's no rational reason. It doesn't even make sense. Why would you not feel like it? You just, you just don't. You ever, and, and, and people that are immature, you hear them talk like that a lot. I just don't feel like it. I just, I just feel like this. And, and I just feel, feel, feel. <laughs> and you're just carnal, carnal, <laughs> carnal. <laughs> you got to learn. It doesn't matter how you feel. That doesn't determine what's true or what's right. How you feel. What's true and right is true and right. No matter what I feel or I don't feel. 
And if we're feeling dominated and feeling controlled and led, we're going to be devil led. Spirit of disobedience controlled. No, no. Say it out loud. I am not not ignorant ignorant of Satan's devices. Didn't the scripture say, neither give place to the devil? What does it give him no place? What does that mean? That means you do have the ability to absolutely shut the door on him and not give him an inch. But you and I will have to get a hold of our feelings and our emotions and our thoughts and our words to do that because you will be tempted. Every one of us, you will be, not might be, you will be. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the, in the world. I think I'll just, I'll just share with you a little bit. You don't have to read all, all the scriptures necessarily. I'll just tell it to you in story form. We saw Adam and Eve fail the don't eat that test. Do you remember another test that the people of God had? The manna test. Hmm? Anybody remember the manna test? How have you read that? Uh, Exodus 16 is where you see the story. The people were complaining, griping about not having anything to eat. And God told them, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a flesh to eat in the evening. I'm going to give you bread to eat in the morning. And I'm sure they thought, where? They're out there in the middle of the desert. And sure enough, in the morning, when the dew fell, there was a little fine flake thing that came with it. The Bible said it was angel's food. It came right out of the sky. And you could put enough of it together, make your pancake, cupcake, whole cake. <laughs> make you a cake. And the Lord said, go out, pick it up. Don't save any of it. Hmm? Is that confusing? Do you need lawyers? Or you need attorneys to help you discern that? And get to, huh? What's the word? Don't save any. Of, don't, don't save any. Go out and get you, gather up what you need and don't try to keep any of it overnight. Don't save any of it. So naturally, what'd they do? What'd they do? Exodus 16, 20 says, Notwithstanding, they hearkened not to Moses, but some of them left of it till the morning, and it bred worms, and it stank, and Moses was wroth with them. Now, please, we've got we to stretch yourself a little bit here. Don't think, well, I know that story. No, do you? Are you sure if you'd have been there, you wouldn't have saved any? The only way you can say no way out to save some is if you can say I've never modified what God told me to do. <laughs> I've never ignored his clear instructions. <laughs> so how, how did they rationalize it? How did they justify it? <laughs> Why did they save some? Wasn't ignorance. The Lord said, don't save it. So why'd they save it? Hmm? I heard somebody say fear. That is one reason. That's a strong reason. We're out here in the desert. There are no grocery stores. Huh? I can't stand to throw this out. Hmm? Folks are starving in other countries. (laughs) And you know, Waste not, won't not. <laughs> hmm? Come on, are you listening? Well, I, you know, no, I'm not throwing that out. That's good manna. See, what is that? It's lack of faith, it's fear, and it's pride saying, I know what God said, but I know better. It's much more serious than we've looked and thought for. And yet people try to say, oh, it won't hurt. I mean, I just put a little, 
I just put a little manna right there in that little Tupperware thing, and I just set it right over there. <laughs> and it, <laughs> what in four ounces? I mean, four ounces of manna, who's that going to hurt? Just a little, and who's going to even know? I just stuck it over there in the corner of the tent. And Somebody say, unfaithful, unfaithful. Unbelieving, unbelieving, fearful, fearful disobedient. disobedient. It may be four ounces of manna, but it's a serious condition of the heart. And then later, they fail that. They fail that test. Later on, just a few days later, he said, now tomorrow is the Sabbath. So you don't go out on the Sabbath to gather manna. The Lord's going to give you extra today. But you don't go out on the Sabbath because there won't be any. And so they went out the, that day and they got twice what they normally would get. And look here, we're all set and we can save it till tomorrow. Did you know sometimes the Spirit of God will say save it? Sometimes he'll say don't save it. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's why you can't make rules. The uh, Spirit of God says you never ever save manna. No, He didn't. He said you don't save it now. Now He said save it. Yeah, that's good. If anybody comes out with a 10,000 volume set on what to do in every situation, <laughs> don't buy it. Save your money. Don't buy it. If that would cover it, you wouldn't need the Holy Ghost. That's why He gave us the Holy Spirit. He's the one that lets us know what to do in every situation. Every day, every night. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Spirit? Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. And the problem is not that he's not helping us and guiding us. The problem is what? Folks are not listening. Not doing what he says do. And it would seem so simple. Well, why in the world? It just doesn't even make sense. Why wouldn't you just do what he said? Because of the spirit of disobedience working and moving and pushing and tempting So what happened on the Sabbath day? Anybody remember reading the story? What happened? What's the clear instruction? Clear instruction. Stay at the house. Don't go out today. Don't look for manna. There won't be any. So what'd they do? What'd they do? Of course. They went out. Verse 27. They went out, some of the people on the seventh day, to gather it. And, and surprise, surprise, they found none. <laughs> Just like the Lord said. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Is the Lord irritated about this? Yes. Now, everybody's awake. What the temptation is on situations like this, and you'll hear it right and left today, is to say, what is the big deal about a little manna? Give me a break. You've got to be kidding me. You're upset because I put the fork on that side? You, you're kidding me. I didn't pass the bucket the way y'all told me to. Well, excuse me. Why can't I wear cutoffs on the platform? God don't care what I got on. He used to. In the Old Testament, he used to. Brother, people say, Brother Keith, you sure you want to go there? I'm there. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> it's not about wearing a coat and a tie that's western anyhow but you know what it is about it's about showing some respect and you don't go to church and serve the Lord in the same attire that you go out in the backyard and grill burgers with come on are you listening well, I don't have anything. If you got two t-shirts and a pair of jeans, 
or two, wear your good ones and make sure they're clean. Come on, are you listening? It wouldn't hurt you to put a crease in it. It's not about money. And when people say, well, God don't care about all that stuff, you're wrong. Read the Bible. He was very, very specific. Every little detail, what he told them to do with his things. So I'm say, we got a new covenant. Yeah, but God didn't change. He's never going to change. Our approach to him has changed. But he hasn't changed. He's not going to change. And it's not a matter that if you have enough money to do something, it's a matter of doing your best. That's what it's about. And that puts us all on the same footing. Just do your best. <laughs> well, if you don't like that, just answer this simple question. When did God change? Go back and read about what he, the instructions he gave with the Levites and the priests. and the order. When, when did he change? We know he never changes. He doesn't change. It's just a matter of doing, doing the best you know how to do. Showing some respect. Showing some honor. And it's, it's as simple as this. Follow your heart. Follow your, you'll be in situations sometimes and the Spirit of God will check you. No, that's not nice enough. Don't do that. Make a change. Make, all you got, don't follow somebody else's rule book or somebody else's dress code, but follow what you get inside. There will be times the Spirit of God will check you. No, you need to go change for that. You need to go do this. You need to go do that. Don't, don't do that like that. Don't have that like this. Just follow the Holy Spirit. So we're not under the law. That's half a verse. That's half a verse. The Bible said, if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So what people are trying to do is substitute law for nothing. They say they were under the law, now we got nothing. We don't do anything. We don't have to do anything. Nothing is required, expected. That's what grace is. Nothing. No. No, what, what has replaced living by the law is being led by the Spirit. Amen. It's not replaced with nothing. It's replaced with being led by the Spirit. And it is not a less holy standard. Man, I didn't even intend to say that. That just came right out of my spirit. It did. That phrase came right out of my spirit. Did, didn't, even, didn't even say hi to my head when it came out. <laughs> oh, the Lord's helping us. He's helping us. He loves us. He doesn't want us fooled and deceived and robbed. He doesn't want that for us. It's not about rules, it is about being led. And don't tell me you're being led when your standards are less than the Old Testament. Unregenerate people. Hmm? No. We don't have a worse covenant. We got a better covenant. Better. Better. Hallelujah. <laughs> some folks going to have to think about some of that. Good. Think about it. To get, get me out of your mind with it, though. Take it to the Word. Take it to the Word. Separate that from me and see if that's what the Word says or not. They, uh, they failed the manna test, didn't they? And they had more than one opportunity to get it right. And you might say, well, manna, brother, you know, what was this such a big deal? It was a giant deal. The same thing that happened with the manna test happened another eight times over the course of the next period of time until they, eight more major times, until they got to the land of Canaan and the Lord told them, go in. It was time. Go in and possess the land. And when it was big 
and it did really matter, you know what they did this time? The exact same thing they did on getting the manna in. The very same, which was why God was so serious with them about it because he knew when they were picking up manna off the ground, if they don't get this fixed, this is going to hit them hard down the road. Come on, can y'all see this, saints? And so what happened? He said, go in and take the land. So what they do? They griped. They cried, didn't they? They said, we're all going to die out here. Is that what he said? Gripe and cry. And feel pity. What did he say? Get yourself together, right? Get your gear on. Go in there and do it. Now, what's the key to miracles? Help me out, everybody. What's the key to miracles? Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, we know that's true because the next generation led by Joshua did it. And God was with them. And they took it. So all this stuff they're saying about we can't was proven to be a lie. Next generation did. But they they could not. uh, Hebrews said they didn't enter in because their unbelief. That word means unpersuadable. There is an ignorant unbelief. But there's another unbelief that's described as unpersuadable. You're not just not believing because you don't know. You know. You just refuse to believe. And they, they would not listen to Joshua and Caleb. They wouldn't listen to the Lord. They felt sorry for themselves. And they decided we're going to appoint a different captain. We go, what we got to do is get new leadership in this place. <laughs> leadership that will take us back to the world and do it the world's way. See, Egypt is a type of the world. It was the flashiest, biggest, broadest empire of the world at that time. It's the world personified. And they said, we need a new captain that will lead us back to the world. And friend, it's always been an issue, and it certainly is an issue today, people trying to bring the world into the church and the world's ways into the church. It is right, left, front, and back. And I don't don't want to claim that I've always done everything perfectly, but isn't it your heart that you don't want that? You don't want that. We don't want to do it the world's way. We want to do it God's way. Right? Don't look to the world to show you how to have your services. Don't look to the world to show you how to have your music. Don't look to the world to show you how to dress and how to have your marriages and how to raise your kids. Don't look to the world. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, we should do what he says. It's going to be different from the, how many believe what he says is going to be different from the world? It's going to be different from the world. And yet that that was their solution. Instead of gathering up their courage and faith and doing what he told them to do, our solution is we're going to the world. Why? Why? Why do you see time after time after time, the Lord says, do this, and they say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. Why is that? Help me out again. It's the spirit of disobedience. And the, and the way it has more power in your life is if you're full of fear, and if you're full of pride, and if you're stubborn. If, if you've got that going in you, the enemy's got handles he can get a hold of to pull on you harder and tempt you. The less fear you got in you, the less he's got to work with with you. The less pride you got in you, the less the devil's got to work with. The quicker you are to believe, less time you give the enemy to even start anything. (laughs) Quicker you are to step out in faith, the devil just, you're already moving into the thing and the devil's going, whoa, whoa, wait, what, what? (laughs) 
No. Give me some time to talk you into no. <laughs> Don't just obey. How many have found out in flowing with the Holy Spirit? I found this out. When the Spirit of God gives you something and it comes up out of your spirit, don't sit and think about it because you will talk yourself out of it. Whatever he says to you. Come on, help me out, Saint John. Well, whatever he says to what is he? He said, go out, go take the land. What's it time to do? Quit calculating. Put your binoculars away. Quit reading the paper. Come on, are y'all listening? Quit watching the news and get yourself in line. Let's go do this thing. Now, we know it had a minute. They, they had it in them because just Matter of hours later, hours later, the Lord said, okay, you don't want to go in? Turn around. Go back in the desert when you came out of it. And actually, what's going to happen is you're going to wander around out there a year for every day that you did this out here today, and you're going to die in the wilderness because you wouldn't believe me these 10 times you have refused to believe me. And, and how many think, can you see now why the manna was such a big deal? God knew. Has God changed or does he still operate that way? He's teaching you on something small. And your flesh and your head is saying, what is the big deal about this? What do people care? It is a big deal. Because the spiritual things involved, the heart's involved. And if you don't get it now, Eventually, it can cost you terribly. And you know what they did? They said, when he said, now turn around and go back into the wilderness. Do y'all remember what, the, what they did then? They said, no. What'd they say? <laughs> they said, no. No, we're going now. We're going up right now. And, and Moses said, don't go. The Lord said, don't go. The Lord's not with you. They said, no, we're going. We're here and we're going. Can you see this? It doesn't even make good sense. The Lord says go, so what do they say? No. no. He says don't go, so what do they say? We're going. Wow, wow. Can you see this? Yes. Of course, you've never done any of that. <laughs> I know years ago, decades ago, I was reading through some of these things in the Old Testament. And I just, I just stopped and put my pen down. I said, Lord, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> he said, they're a lot like y'all. <laughs> I said, no, no. <laughs> and then he quoted the scripture to me in Corinthians. These things are written as our examples. Yeah, yeah. Aren't they? Yeah. Is the spirit of disobedience in the world still? Yes. Is it endeavoring to influence people? Yes. They failed the man of tests. And they didn't get it right another time and another time and another time and another time and another time. And the tenth time, they failed the big test by doing the same thing and it cost them. And they ran out of time. And they missed the perfect plan of God for their life. Somebody say, by the grace of God, not me. Do we have anything to say about it? Is it up to us whether we obey or not? But what we've got to do is get a revelation that the little thing matters. The small thing in the eyes of people or in our own eyes, it matters a great deal. Go with me please to uh, 1 Samuel. Have you got a little time? I'm not quite through. 1 Samuel 6. Man, the Lord's helping us tonight. I know he is. 1 Samuel 6. You're going to 1 Samuel 6. I'm going to read some verses to you to just reinforce this. Don't try to turn to these I'm reading right now. Just listen. Deuteronomy 4.2. The Lord said, You shall not add to the word I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. You'll keep the commandment the Lord your God that I command you. Deuteronomy 12, 32. 
Deuteronomy 12, 32, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, you shall not add thereto nor diminish from it. In Joshua 1, 7, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Proverbs 30, verse 6, add not to his words lest he reprove you and you be found to be a liar. These thoughts, you see them throughout the Word. Don't modify what He told you. Don't change it. Somebody say, don't change it. Don't change it. How many would agree it's arrogance to change it? Yes. You're acting like you know better than Him. How ignorant is that? Now, one of the clearest examples of this is the new cart syndrome. <laughs> new cart, C-A-R-T. <laughs> now, scriptorians already know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to say, new cart? Yeah. New cart. Also, a.k.a. modernization. <laughs> a.k.a. upgrade. Y'all going to help me with this or not? Huh? <laughs> with God, new does not equal better. Because when he said it, it was perfect. It doesn't need an upgrade. When he told you to do something, it doesn't need modernizing. Hmm? Not his things. The people of God had gotten away from God. And the Philistines, they fought the Philistines and they lost the battle. And they lost the Ark of the Covenant. They lost it. You talk about a beaten, demoralized people. They lost it all. And the Philistines realized that Egypt had come head to head with the God of the Israelites and didn't come out so good. And, and their spiritual advisor said, what you need to do is get this ark out of here. And we'll do it like this. We will get a cart and we will get some milk cows that have just had calves and we'll pin their calves up, and then we'll turn these loose. And of course, normally a cow would go back to its calf. But if these cows take off and take this thing back to them, we know this is spiritual. And their God, of course, their God was Dagon. He had a fish tail. <laughs> so they, what they know about God wouldn't fill up the bottom of a thimble. They know nothing about God. And so they put the ark on the cart and they hooked the milk cows to it. And with seemingly success, because the milk cows took off and they hauled that ark right back to the people of God. So it, it seems like real success. It worked. It worked. But then in 2 Samuel 6, don't you think this is interesting? 1 Samuel 6 is about to cart. 2 Samuel 6 is about another cart. 2 Samuel 6 verse 1. Are you, are you getting there with me? They'll put it on the screen for us. David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Because you know the, uh, the ark had gotten back to the, and it had stayed at these people's house for a length of time. And David decided, we need to get that ark back where it belongs. And the people that were with him went from Baal of Judah to bring up the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwells between the cherubim, verse 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart, brand new. 
And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, which is where the Philistines' cart had brought it on in. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. Got good boys up there driving, good family, spiritual people. Got a brand new cart. Verse 4, is everything okay? Has anybody read this or not? Huh? They brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. He's in front of the ark, making sure the way's clear, everything's good. New cart, good drivers, good procession. Everything's good. We're serving God. <laughs> Come on, y'all with me? It's a big day. Taking the ark back. On my way, taking the ark back. And verse 5, David and all the house of Israel played before the I told you they were playing and singing. And <laughs> instruments, man, they were playing, they were singing. Psalteries, harps, timbrels, cornets, cymbals. You could hear the music blocks away. Here they come, verse 6. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen that were pulling the new cart stumbled and the ark kind of rocked. And he thought, oh no, don't let the ark fall off the cart. And he reached up to steady it like any good Christian would. <laughs> or believer in God, I should say. Verse 7. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him for his error, and he died by the ark of the God. Right there, boom, he died and fell out right there by the ark. And the whole thing stopped, and the music stopped. Keep reading. David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach on Uzzah. And so he named that spot, he made a memorial there and called it Perez Uzzah. Verse 9, and David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? And nobody wanted to drive the cart. <laughs> nobody wanted to hold on to it. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but it was very serious, wasn't it? What's what happened here? Now see, a lot of people would read this and go, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. What kind of God let something like that happen? That just shows you don't know him, don't understand things. What has happened is they have ignored him and ignored him and they have changed up everything he told them to do. And it is so far from what he told them to do until this is the last straw. They are out here parading the ark on a cart pulled by oxen. Anybody thinks they can come up and stick their hand on it. Come on, are you listening? There is no respect. There is no reverence. And God said, I'm still God. And my things are still holy. Amen. And they were shocked. And they needed to be. I said they needed to be. God gave them, go back and read it sometime. Exodus 25, Deuteronomy 10, Joshua 3. He gave them very, very specific instructions about how this is to be carried. Didn't he? He gave a blueprint out of heaven to Moses. Is that right? And he told Moses, see to it that you make this and you do this exactly the way I gave it to you. 
They were, that, that ark was made out of very specific materials. It was made to very specific dimensions. It was made, he said, and you're to put rings in it, certain size and materials. And you're to make uh, staves or rods out of certain material. And the only people that can, can carry it are these people from this family. And they're not to touch it. The rod is supposed to go on their shoulder. And when they lead, there's supposed to be X amount of distance between them and anybody else. Nobody gets close to this. Come on, are you listening? Yes. You remember in uh, Joshua when he told them to cross the river and the priests bore the ark on their shoulders and when their feet got into the water, that thing split like the Red Sea did. Yes, it did. No cart no cows, no just anybody coming up and holding on to it if they wanted to. Why? The issue is when, you, when God goes to that much effort, gives you that much detail and shows you what to do and you act like he didn't say anything and you create a plan out of the blue that you got from the Philistines. Come on, are y'all listening? Yes. Who's the first ones to put the cart, ark on a cart? Now, why didn't they all fall dead? Because they ain't got a clue what the ark, right? What the ark is. They don't know. And that's why they seem to come out okay. But then here are the people of God that have the law. They've got all the instructions about how to do this. And they just throw it out, out the window and, and borrow from the world. Come on, are you listening? And we're going to do it the way the world does. That's when you don't have the anointing. And that's when you don't get the increase. And, we, and, and you don't have the presence of God. Now I know that we're under grace. I know that all of our sins have been paid for. I know that. But has God changed? Did he change? Does the way he thinks, his, his nature? No. No. How many want to please him? Yes. Should we take him seriously when he tells us something? Yes. And when he says do something a certain way, what should we do? We should make up our mind. I'm not going to add to this. I'm not going to take from this. I want to do this exactly the way you told me to, Lord. Which is why when you get instructions from the Lord, you need to record them. You need to write them down. Come on, are y'all listening to me? I, you know, these phones nowadays have recorders on them. I keep mine with me all the time. Uh, in, in years past, there were times that the Lord would wake me up in the middle of the night and give me direction on something. And I think, glory to God, that's good. And I'd roll over to go back to sleep. And the Lord said, he said to me one time, he said, you don't value that enough to even try to write it down. I said, forgive me, Lord. Because you, hey, have anybody ever got something before that was so clear and then later on you couldn't even remember it? Yes. That's because you were more in the spirit at that time than you realized you were. And then later on you get over in the flesh and it's not there. So when we get direction from the Lord, how many think we ought to get it down exactly the way he gave it to us? And then I don't care who think they've got a better idea. We're not changing it. I've had people get irritated with me and go, why won't you do what I want to do? I said, I don't do what I want to do. Why would I do what you want me to do? I know God's not real to some people, but he really is the big boss around here. How about you? How many would say at my house, he's the big boss? Yeah. If he is your Lord, what happens? Do what he you says. do what he says. We do what he says. Stand up on your feet if you would, please. Let's lift our hands and give him praise and give him thanks. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Master. 
Thank you, Master. I know some people would say, ah, oh, Brother Keith, that's Old Testament, that's, that's law, that's this, that's... This. Listen, I know we're not under the law. I know that's not how we're justified with God. But is it important that we follow precisely the directions of the Holy Spirit today? It is. It is. And no, not listening and changing it up, it may not just cause a disaster or, or ruin everything, but if you don't get that fixed, there can come a time eventually where it does cost you seriously. No doubt. Phyllis and I have been in the ministry now for 30 some years. In the beginning, some of the things the Lord directed us to do seemed so trivial, so small, little bitty things. I remember one of the first offerings that I really knew it was him, it was $5. And yet I just knew that I knew. It was all I had too. And I knew I was supposed to sow it. Another time, my shoe money. <laughs> Y'all heard me tell about that one. And, and different things. But I didn't realize it, but the Lord's teaching me and teaching Phyllis how to be led and that it's important to do exactly what he said, the way he said, when he said, where he said. And if you practice that year after year, decade after decade, it becomes a way of life. And the Lord is able to spare you from problems. There's been times... I can, I can go back and look and point to time after time, Phyllis and I would be dead. We wouldn't be here. But the Lord dealt with us. Check this. Don't do this. Don't go right now. Don't go today. Don't get involved with that. I know friends of mine have lost their ministries, lost their finances because somebody hoodwinked them, tricked them. And there's been more than one time the enemy tried to do that to us. But the Spirit of God, I didn't, we didn't know why. He just said, don't do that. Go here. Don't go there. Don't, don't have dinner with them. Don't get involved with this. Don't go to that meeting. Don't be a part of that conference. Be a part of this one. I was sitting in the plane one day. The jet that the Lord gave us back years ago. We're all ready to go. Everybody's in the plane. Um, it's cold outside. We're running a little bit late. Everybody, people have been waiting on me already for a while. I was flying that day. I asked the guy on the line, I said, did y'all put the pin in the, uh, the nose wheel on that particular airplane? You take the pin out to tow it and you put the pin in to steer it. If the pin's not in, you don't have any steering. They said, oh yeah, we checked the pin. All right, we're in a hurry. And so uh, the guy I was flying with asked him, Are you, we checked the pin? Oh yeah, they checked the pin, we checked the pin. No, the pin's there. We shut the door, harnessed in, start the engine. It came up again, check the pin. I said, I'm checking the pin. <laughs> Should I don't care who, who's waiting? I shut everything down. I opened the door. What do you think? Pin was not in. Pin and the wind was blowing, howling from the side. And you know, you're running over 100 miles an hour before you break ground and that wind is hitting you. And if we had run off the, uh, the runway and crashed into a fence or an antenna full of fuel and exploded, people would have said, wonder what happened to that preacher? Thought he was a man of God. Thought he, you know, well, every one of us need to listen and pay attention even when it doesn't make sense. Even when we don't know why. Do you believe it? It's not about law. It's about being led. Yeah. It's about respecting what the Lord said. Can you say amen? amen? Thank you, Lord. Phyllis, you want to come up? You got something? No. You want them to sit down? No. No. You want to step up here where they can see you? Thank you, Lord. You know, Keith's been talking about holiness, and he's been talking about us doing what God says do. And today it's so easy just to do, I know just me as being a leader or as being a pastor or as being anything, it's so much easier sometimes just to give in. 
because you don't want to offend people and you don't want to rub them the wrong way and you want to keep your employees and you want to keep your church people and you want to keep this and you want to keep that. So it's just so much easier just to give in. But you know what? There's a verse that just came up in my heart and I thought, Lord, I'm just not doing that anymore. And see what you think about it. In Mark 16, in verse 19, well, actually 20, it says the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them, confirming their ideas with signs following. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I would like to see everybody's church bigger than what it is today. And I think there's a lot of people in the world that need to get saved. And I think there's a lot of things going on in the world that people are lacking seeing the moving of the Spirit is why they're not in church. They're seeing that the Christians are just almost the same as the world. And the reason is because the church is trying to be the same thing as the world. But this says, and the Lord worked, them, worked with them and confirmed his word with signs following. He didn't say he would confirm our ideas or our plans or our procedures or the way we do anything. He would confirm his word with signs following. And I know, and I know Keith too, wants to see the signs following. And it's time that we quit giving in to what anybody wants or anybody thinks or if we're going to lose somebody, if we're going to get somebody. i got news for you. We start doing what God says do and the places are going to fill up because the signs are going to follow. When you see people get healed and people get delivered and people get set free and people get speaking in tongues and legs grow out and eyes open and ears open and things happen, then people are going to come to church. When cancers drop off of people and, and things that have been in people's lives forever and they can't get healed by going to the doctor anymore because they don't have the answers for them, but they can come to church because people are not afraid to speak the word like what he's been speaking tonight. And the signs follow and people get healed and set free. Then the doors are going to fling open and people are going to start coming in. But it's when we're afraid that we're going to lose somebody or we're afraid that we're going to offend somebody or we're going to lose a staff member or we're going to lose a church member or we're going to lose somebody because we're not going to do what God said do. We're going to do what they said do because we're not going to have their money or we're not going to have their this. We're never going to have the signs following. But when we do what God says do, miracles are going to be popping like popcorn all around us because He will confirm His Word with signs following. That's Him saying this. We don't have to do anything. When we do His Word, the signs are going to follow. It's just like what He said about the faithfulness and the blessing. If we're not having the signs following, guys, we need to wake up. Have we been doing His Word? I know me for one. I'm going to quit looking at what somebody might think or somebody might say. I don't want to offend anybody, but I want to please God. And that's most important to me. What about you? It's time that we, we start doing what He says do and thinking about what He says He wants more than what we think people want. Because you know what? I learned this a long time ago. When you do what God wants, you actually do please the people. And they don't even know it's what they want, but it is what they want. When we do what God says do, they get the help they need, and they get the answers they need, and they get everything, their bodies healed, and their finances, and everything else. But they just think they want the other. Can you say amen? Amen. I'm so excited to be here this week because I'm I just keep thinking, okay, I gotta change that out. Who was it said that a while ago? What did they say? Huh? Starting to hurt, yeah. Get some steel-toed shoes on in here. But you know what? We're growing up. 
We wouldn't be getting this unless we were growing up. Can you say amen? amen? I tell you what, can we sing faithfulness again? I think we can. And we're going to be faithful people and we're going to be blessed people. And the signs and wonders of God are going to follow in our churches and in our ministries. And we're going to begin to see people delivered and set free and miracles happening all around us. Glory to God. I'm excited about it. Are y'all excited about it? I can't wait to see what he's going to do for us. It's time we get back into those things, don't you think? The holiness of God back in church again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead, guys. Altar care workers, come to the front, if you would, and uh, we'll be dismissed, and we'll see you tomorrow night.